So I'm, I'm looking over, I'm going to start off, I'm looking over, we have Jack Imhoff here today with us, and um, I'm looking over his bio, and it says Natural Biologist Director of Conservation and Eco Ecology, and then Dash, retired, and yet nothing about Jack is retired, okay, <laughs> he's still doing <laughs> all his work in conservation, he's consulting, mm -hmm. um, are you still an adjunct professor with uh, Waterloo? No, no, I'm, I've stepped down from that. You've stepped, okay, so you're semi-retired then. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm just, well, I was just an adjunct. Um, I'm still yeah. doing a few lectures each year, but that's about it. Oh. So the top, my topic uh, this evening is uh, Return of the Coasters, uh, a story of fisheries and fishing success. I want to um, also acknowledge uh, that uh, some of these images, some of these images are my own, some of these images our images uh, taken uh, by um, and, and loaned to me by the new fly fisher. Um, I, I, I'll explain a little bit more about uh, that um, aspect as well. Uh, specifically, most of these uh, photographs uh, that the new fly fisher uh, loaned me were taken by Ryan uh, Pizzacala, who was the cameraman on the trip that I took with uh, Mar Mark Melnick up to uh, Lake Superior to fish for coasters. There we go. Okay. So the outline is, first of all, so, oh, by the way, that's Ryan. Um, what is a coaster? Uh, what was it like uh, over 100 years ago uh, with, with, with the fisheries on Lake Superior? What happened to that fishery? Uh, what are the causes of the demise to a large degree of the, of the original populations of coasters in Lake Superior? A little bit about the road to recovery and then a little bit more about fishing for these, uh, these incredible animals and uh, where we're going from here. So that's the overview of the presentation. Uh, the fir first thing that is to say is, what is a coaster? Well, a coaster is a brook trout that moves from its natal stream and spends much of its life in, in the lake, in this case, uh, Lake Superior. Uh, historically, we likely had coasters in all the Great Lakes where we had cold water streams dumping into uh, those Great Lakes, but uh, we've pretty well done a real job on the uh, ability of these and of, of brook trout to move out of natal streams until from Lake Erie into, um, into uh, the big lake of Lake, Lake Erie or Lake Ontario. The name of coaster is derived from their habit, so the habit of cru cruising along the coast of the lake, close to the sh close to shore. So they coasted along the shore coasters. They were once plentiful and quite often considered but, uh, between them and lake trout as the iconic fish of Lake Superior. And the exciting thing now is that through all the amazing work that's been done in the last 20 years, or actually almost 30 years now, they're starting to, rec starting to reclaim their historical range. And I'll be talking quite a bit more about that. That reclamation began at their anchor point, which has been and still is the Great Nipigon River, which is also the home of the world record brook trout. Now, the ability to move uh, from one body of water, like a stream, um, into a lake is also, is also um, the same ability that uh, brook trout in the East Coast have to move out of uh, the rivers, the East Coast into the ocean. And there they're called salters. So it's a similar type of life history strategy. Um, you move out of the stream, if there's too many of, the, of your, of your uh, neighbors or too many of your progeny, you move out into the big water where there's a lot more food and a lot more space and you grow bigger. And then you come back to spawn. So, uh, uh, coasters are the, what I consider the freshwater equivalent of salters on the East Coast. I think coasters on average grow a little bit bigger in part because they don't have the uh, physiological debt that occurs uh, with uh, brook trout that move into salt, which have to change physiologically and change their uh, osmoregulation as well so they can survive in salt water. Co uh, but uh, it, it's, everything else is similar. The, um, when, the, when a brook trout moves out of streams, in Lake, uh, into Lake Superior, it gets a silvery sheen, very much like the salters you get on the East Coast as well. So a little bit about history. Believe it or not, in the 1860s, the 1880s, the Nipigon River and its near shore areas were considered the greatest trout fishery in North America. This is not me saying this, this these are outdoor magazines from the US and Canada at that time. Uh, Everybody from European royalty, Canadians, and Americans of means flocked to Nipigon by boat, 
horse and carriage to fish for these gigantic brook trout. And you can see there, that's a, a sort of an example of some of the harvest of these fish. Coasters were, not only that, but coasters were caught, so many coasters were caught that quite often they were sent in bar by barrel to restaurants in Toronto and Chicago. But no fishery can sustain that type of pressure for very long. And, uh, and by 1880, uh, 1885, populations were diminishing rapidly because there were no harvest restrictions at all. And that's when harvest restrictions started to a certain degree, but not very enthusiastically. The historical distribution of coaster brook trout and their spawning streams can be shown on the map on the upper right, which shows all these little points and all these little tributaries. Main River, here's the Nipigon River coming down here. These are all smaller rivers and streams all the way down to uh, Sault Ste. Marie and on the south coast shore all the way around Lake Superior. These were all streams that held coaster brook trout spawning historically. And as I said, the world record brook trout, which we thought was possibly a coaster, we don't know, was caught in 1915 by Dr. Cook. It was 14 and a half pounds in size. And that weight was taken after it had been lying around in the bush for two days because the doctor spent a couple more days fishing before he brought it to civilization and was able to put it on a scale. So potentially it was larger than that. And by the, by the return of the last century, the population was collapsing and, and the distribution was shrinking dramatically. So some of the causes of the demise of these trout and coasters, there were multiple things going on historically over harvest, and including up until relatively recently. Also the building of the railway and roads across the North Shore of Superior uh, quite often did not worry about whether or not fish could move up and down underneath these, um, up and down the rivers underneath these uh, roads and these rail lines. And many of those uh, rail uh, bridges and are, are, are perch culverts and fish can go down, but they can't come back up. And that still exists today. Much of the North Shore streams, many of the smaller ones that historically had uh, probably produced uh, a few hundred coasters uh, or a few hundred uh, brook trout juveniles that moved out to the lake. Those, those fish cannot get back up into those uh, tributaries still. Also, there was development of hydroelectric power beginning in 1913, right in, uh, in the lower part of Nipigon. There was the first uh, power dynamo. And by 1940, the major dams at Victoria Falls were built. And that was pretty well spelled the doom for the ability of these animals to move up and down these rivers. And after that, water level fluctuations from hydro peaking occurred. Now, by water fluctuations, I mean, on average, 1.5 to 2 meters twice a day, vertically. So that's a lot of fluctuation. And it's a big river, so but that's still a lot of fluctuation. Populations then along those shores and in the main remaining river, the Nipigon, sharply contracted. So the blue dots are the historical concentrations as far as we know it from historical records of brook trout all along. You can see right from around just before one, well, just after Wawa, all the way down Batchewana Bay, that's Batchewana Bay, oh, actually no, that's Batchewana Bay, all from Batchewana Bay all the way around to Lake Superior Provincial Park, um, everywhere, all along. This was the historical ranges of these brook trout. And by 1990, 1980s, 1990s, this was the remaining distribution. As a matter of fact, the vast majority were sitting, hugging close to the shore, right around the mouth of Nipigon or just staying in the Nipigon River. So we had lost, we had almost lost completely that population. So what happened? Well, I like to say that many people came together, but it was one man that was the catalyst for everything that happened up in, the, in that area, neck of the woods. And that gentleman was a, an avid angler and biologist by the name of Rob Swainson. He's a good friend of mine known Rob for many, many, many years. He became district biologist in Nipigon in 1988. And he, the reason, he was originally worked up in Algonquin Park for a number of years. He actually grew up in Southern Ontario, but loved brook trout and thought that, that, that the, the Nipigon must be the place to go if, you're, if you love brook trout and want to work with brook trout as a biologist. However, he got there and realized he had a problem. Shortly after he arrived there, a gentleman by the name of Ray Dupuis Sr. came to talk to him. And uh, Ray is, um, is part Indigenous and um, a Red Rock band, I believe, as well as an avid angler. And he said, 
I don't see coasters and brook trout anymore along the shoreline like I did 30, 40, 50 years ago. And Rob said, you mean you caught them there? He said, no, I saw them. I could see schools of them. He said, I don't see that anymore. I haven't seen that for almost 10 years now. Something's happening. We, the fishery is collapsing and we need to do something about it. So Rob started to consider what the heck was going on with these fish and started to explore what the problems were. So he determined a number of problems. First of all, the pulsing of the river by the hydroelectric dams was a big problem. Um, he was able to document the, uh, the act of dewatering of the vast majority of reds, of, of uh, coastal brook trout reds he could find along the Nipigon River twice a day by flow pulsing. As well, anglers, if they caught one, they kept it. Yeah, it was the, that's the nature of Northern Ontario. A lot of it is harvest, whether it's your hunter or an angler. And, and, you know, a lot of people don't have a lot of money. They do live to a certain degree off the land. But over harvest is definitely one of the issues. And also the blockage of many of these traditional smaller spawning streams was also a problem. So he had a number of issues to deal with. But at the same time, the angler said, oh, I can still find these fish. And, you know, it can't be that bad. So he had to figure out a way to try to help them understand what the problem was. And one of the solutions he came up with was he said, you don't have to listen to me. Why don't I get you guys to help me by tagging these fish and monitoring how often we catch them and recapture them. So he initiated a tagging program with the local anglers to allow them to see for themselves uh, how many fish there really were. And this worked to convince them to let the fish grow. And part of that was in many cases, these same anglers would tag a fish and maybe two days, three days later, they catch it again. In one case, one, one angler and his grandson over the course of a weekend fishing caught the same fish three times. That's fishing big water. So, and they were working all over the darn place. So that told them that sure, the fish moved around, but there weren't very many if I'm keeping catching the same one all the time. So that certainly helped to start to get the anglers on board and supporting his suggestions on what they needed to do. At the same time, he worked with the uh, with the uh, Red Rock Band and, and also because they had a long tradition of brook trout as part of their ceremonies and an important part of their uh, food source as well, historically. He also then worked to readjust Ontario Hydro and convince them to moderate their river peaking operation. Because as I said, they were peaking the river uh, but, uh, vertically 1.5 to 2 meters twice a day. And that was uh, really affecting the reds. They, uh, they negotiated how much they had to moderate that peaking to keep those reds wet. Um, I'd like to say they did that completely voluntarily, but at the time, actually, I think the Fisheries Act came into place and they decided they'd rather work with him than go to court. But it, that was a good news story. They did come around and they, they have uh, been a pretty good partner ever since. The tagging was definitely a key to uh, ha having these uh, folks understand that there weren't that many of them out there and that they needed to, A, allow them to grow because it, it was quite easy. <laughs> As much as I love these fish, they're almost as dumb as uh, cutthroat trout. Well, cutthroat trout that haven't seen too many anglers. So uh, they, they can be caught quite actively many times if they're in the same area. So based upon that, things started to change. At the same time, there was uh, supporting research on this. Uh, the, there was long-term monitoring by the Lake Superior Management Unit, and that is still ongoing. They've been working with the helping with the tagging and recording taking the information from the anglers on tags and tag, tag captures and recaptures. They've also been monitoring and assessing various tributary streams and, and, and trying to identify where there's blockages to help these fish in the future. Also, there was research done many years ago by a young, at the time, MSC master's student, Sylvia D'Amelio. And Sylvia, uh, research question was, are coasters a different uh, genetic variant of, uh, compared to stream-dwelling uh, brook trout in that area? And the short answer was no, there's simply a life cycle strategy. In other words, if the fish has an opportunity or stress and makes it and they want to leave, they leave. If the stream is really cold and is very stable, they don't leave. So it has, so that actually became, uh, that information was verified by another research that um, ourselves at Troy to Limited Canada found had money for and that was a research study to look at the role of habitat condition in creating coaster brook trout and what we were able to demonstrate through uh, three years of research and data collection was that habitat conditions dictated 
whether the fish would have a migratory behavior or not. And specifically, those conditions were poor habitat or highly fluctuating water temperatures or, high or highly fluctuating summer stream temperatures. Any of those or any of those in combination would mean that the fish would quite often maybe reproduce in that stream and when, it, when it's cold, they'd move out as quickly as they could and their fry would then move out over the course of a, a season and then only come back much later when they're ready to spawn. Other streams that had perfect conditions, the fish never left. So it was, it was more habitat driven than it was genetic. But the, the aspect of genetics that comes to play is that brook trout are, have very many different types of life history strategies to cope highly variable conditions. So other actions that, uh, that helped the, uh, the, co the coastal return, probably one of the biggest ones was the, with the support of the community swing, uh, Rob decided to try to establish special angling regulations on the Nipigon River in the early 1990s. He proposed and finally was able to pass a one fish a limit per day, minimum size of 18 inches. Within three years, many people were catching many 18 inch fish. At the same time, he was trying to get the river and the lake linked together with, uh, with better re regulations. And in talking to some of the anglers, the anglers said, well, if these fish can easily get up to 18 and bigger, why don't we change our regulation and adjust it for one fish with a minimum size of 22 inches and see how that works. And that was established in the early, and that, that was then established for both the river and the lake in the early 2000s. In addition to that, one of the things we need, did need to do as well was to better protect the, uh, the, the one of the core spawning areas of coastal brook trout in the Nipigon River. And um, I would believe it was around 2004 or 2005, Rob came to Trout Unlimited and Parks Canada's um, came to us and said that uh, they were starting to develop a national marine conservation area for Lake Superior and they were going to run the national marine conservation area up the uh, out of Lake Superior, the bed of Lake Superior, up the Nipigon River to Gapen's Pool um, so that they could capture the most important brook trout spawning area, the coastal spawning area in the lower Nipigon River. The trouble is they had no money at the time for land acquisition and, they were, and the property was coming up for sale and they were worried that they would lose it and not be able to protect the uh, spawning area of coastal brook trout. So they asked Trout Limited if we'd be willing to help to try to acquire those properties. So we did. In 2008, uh, Trout Limited, with the support of many folks, including our, our, uh, our, our uh, sister organization, States Trout Limited US, who also put money towards this, we acquired the land, you can see in the circle here, the land on the north east corner of the intersection uh, of Highway 17 Bridge. And that is, uh, that's part of Gapen's pool, where uh, I think it was Don Gapen uh, invented the Mudford Minnow. Anyway, these little red lines here are locations where coasts are spawn in, in this particular year. And this is the property here. And the reason this is so important is that this is a large sand gravel moraine that's a massive infiltration area that, dry, that dry, creates a high water, groundwater table that moves off the land and discharges and, and, and upwellings all along the side of Gapen's pool. And that's why the brook trout spawn there is because of that, uh, those upwellings and that groundwater activity. And we, that's why we want to protect it. So a whole variety of things came, uh, came to fruition to start to save these animals and to start to see if we get them back on the road to recovery. So what's happened since? Well, first of all, there's been strong support from the towns of Nipigon and Red Rock for, for this to happen. And for the angling community in Thunder Bay as well, who came on board, Gord Ellis and all these, gang, these guys um, you know, started to realize that this was a good news story and they wanted to be part of it. Also, what really was a game changer uh, back in the 90s was when the OFVH created a catch and release category for their big fish contest. Up to that point, any big brook trout that was caught was kept because people wanted a nice prize. When that catch and release category uh, came in, that meant people could catch these beautiful fish, take a quick measurement and release them live to allow, to allow them to survive. And that also was a big game changer. So what happened? The brook trout populations in the Nipigon River dramatically began to increase as did the size and numbers and the size 
and the fish began to be become more common in the lake. It started to become more actively coasters again. The 2004 article, for example, in uh, the uh, the uh, Canadian Fly Fisher magazine, uh, Scott Earl Smith indicated that at that point, by 2004, which is a few years after those new regulations were put in place, the coasters were now being caught regularly in the inner Nipigon Bay. Not, not out in the Big Lake, but at least they were moving out of the Nipigon River and starting to move along the coastline in the bay. More recently, in the last 10 years, uh, coasters are now moving along the outer islands and, uh, and the outer shoreline both east and west and south from, Nipigan, uh, from the Nipigan River and from the inner Nipigan Bay. This has meant has been a resurgence in lodge and destination fish in, the, in, the, in Nipigan and is pro pro providing more income to communities there on a, a to a large degree catching on these bases as more and more people come to fish for coaster brook trout and lake trout in this area. So, how did I get up? Well, I've, <laughs> I've been up there many times, but I never had a chance to fish for coasters. And I had a call from, from um, Colin McEwen back about a year ago saying, hey, Jack, would you like to come up and uh, be a host of, uh, for the new fly fisher where we want to do a, um, a show on coaster brook trout? And we thought that as a biologist, you might be able to uh, sort of add a little bit of uh, interest to, uh, to, the, um, to the story about coasters. And I said, absolutely. So, um, uh, we were invited to be, uh, so I, they invited me to be a co-host on an episode at the Bowman Island Lodge which, and Charters, which I think a number of you guys at the, at the Isaac Walton Club have already been to that lodge at least once or twice in the last little while. Uh, the lodge itself was developed over the last 15 years by lifelong residents and anglers Gary and Leanne uh, Lang. Uh, the lodge is on the uh, northern tip of Bowman Island, which is at the very edge of the big water of uh, Lake Superior. Up to 2004, fish were being caught in this area, along this shoreline. But since then, they moved out and into the big, bigger water of the lake. Uh, St. Ignace Lake and the small little islands, island right here, I'll show you another example of it in a bit, um, are the outer islands. Uh, after you pass the outer islands, uh, the next stop is Wisconsin and Minnesota. So um, this is, uh, so you're in big water, close to big water in this area. The trip itself is really a wonderful trip uh, out to the island. Uh, it takes about an hour on uh, Gary's relatively new boat that he's got. Um, you, start, you go right into Nipigon. You meet with Gary and his uh, his uh, and, and his wife Leanne and their dog Bridget. And we this is the uh, the newer boat. He's got two. He's got a larger boat for uh, charters so if people that want to do cruises along the shoreline of Lake Superior. Or this boat is more so, more so for getting equipment and materials out to the um, to the um, to the lodge. So we got that uh, with, together with Gary in the morning of um, uh, on in late May. Uh, got our gear all stored, and then we headed off out of uh, up up Nipigon Bay, south on, on Nipigon Bay, away from the town of Nipigon and Red Rock. Has some beautiful cliff faces, and those white blotches there are actually. Uh, uh, um, pelicans flying in a, a big flock of pelicans, which is kind of cool. Uh, Gary's boat is uh, very, very well equipped. Uh, it's got uh, radar and sonar, uh, as, um, as well as a very strong engine. So it was very comfortable, very comfortable on, on, on traveling. And we found that the, uh, that the sonar and the radar, uh, and uh, it was, or I should say the bathymetry map and the radar was very handy because Gary said, it may be kind of warm around here, he said, but uh, the fellows further out on the lake are telling me there's heavy fog banks. So he said, we'll need to navigate by, uh, by instruments. And he was right. Uh, you can see in the distance there, this is just a solid fog bank coming. We we're approaching and we hit that. And we just basically went fairly slow through a really dangerous water. Thank God Gary knows the area like the back of his hand, because there's a lot of shoals in this area. Anyway, after about an hour, we could see the uh, lodge coming through the haze. Mark um, and Leanne uh, got ourselves set to uh, land. There's the lodge there. And a part of the, uh, of the, uh, the setup are these uh, three fishing boats with large motors with uh, fish finders and uh, other equipment. These are for the uh, anglers that uh, come and uh, visit uh, and to stay at the lodge. The lodge itself is um, very comfortable. It's off the grid. It's uh, actually, uh, the electricity is maintained by uh, by solar panels. 
And the cooking is done by propane. He's also got a couple of wood stoves as well as backup. And he even had a booster system set up so that uh, we could get Wi-Fi occasionally at the right location in the, in the lodge if we wanted to. And also cell coverage uh, to a certain degree in one location. For some reason, TELUS didn't work, but Rogers uh, seemed to work quite well. It pinged off uh, one of the uh, uh, one of the uh, towers, some place around Nip again. But very comfortable lodge, is very comfortable, a nice uh, seated area, a comfortable kitchen and a dining area, nice big windows, uh, lots of light. At, at the same time, after we had landed the, the larger boat, uh, Ryan uh, Pizzicala said, uh, yeah, "said we're just going to walk along the dock and." Gary, uh, Gary said, yeah, if you go around the corner of the dock there, close to the edge, that's not too deep there. He said there's been a coaster that's been sitting there for the last few weeks. Uh, he might still be there. Well, sure enough, he was. And, and Ryan, being a good cameraman, took his, uh, his uh, GoPro and his uh, other equipment along and was able to get a few shots. The, the picture of the coaster from above that I had at the, um, at the title slide is one of his picks. And there's a close-up of, uh, of the guy sitting there as well. Beautiful fish, absolutely beautiful, beautiful fish. Uh, we, we nicknamed him uh, Pumpkin for some reason, I don't know why. And uh, we all agreed that we weren't going to fish for him at all. We were just leave him be because well, he seemed like he liked it there and we weren't sure if he was um, not feeling well or if he just, uh, just didn't want to be bothered. So we just left him alone. I just want to stress that Gary is one of these guys that <laughs> If you're in a, an apocalypse, uh, you probably want to have a guy like Gary around because uh, he's very handy. Um, he basically built this uh, log carrier himself so that he could uh, fell some timbers on his island, on his property, move them down to the portable um, sawmill that he has on site. And there he cuts the logs and the beams for his cabins that he builds. So other than nails and other things that you require, um, the wood itself and the planking and such, and even the floors and the paneling were cut on the spot on, on site by Gary and his equipment. So just as a little uh, sort of uh, advertisement for Gary, uh, the main lodge uh, can sleep seven to eight people. There's three um, bunk rooms that, in total, seven to eight people. There's also an outer cabin that has, you can have another four or five. There's another small cabin that has a sauna, which was kind of nice after a day of long fishing when it was really cold out. Uh, he has a variety of fishing packages for different uh, lengths of stay. As one example, one person, three days, four nights. It's about $1,300 with the 2021 rates. That includes the transportation. It's an hour there and back. All the meals, breakfast, brunch, supper at the lodge, plus those long boats with four-stroke motors, for, uh, one, uh, one per two anglers, tipped with seats, net depth finder, safety gear, and so on and so forth. By the way, the fishing is so good that virtually all, almost all of our fishing was done within sight of the lodge. So it's not as though you have to go great distances away from the lodge to find fish and uh, where we were staying. But it was, a, it was beautiful. The area is lovely. And uh, there's, I think there's one other um, small um, camp further down uh, from Gary that you can occasionally see if you really strain your neck. But otherwise, there's nobody. You're out there by yourself. The first morning, I'll talk a little bit more about the fishing, but the first morning, Gary went out with us just to show us where he uh, suggested we should be fishing and the types of structure and habitat we should be fishing. So uh, this is us getting going the first morning. Temperatures were cold. I, mornings when we got up, it was like plus two. And sometimes got up to plus eight. Maybe one day got up almost up to um, 10, but not, not really. It was, it was staying pretty cool. Uh, the shoreline can look featureless unless you know what you're looking for, but there's a lot of it, and it's virtually all different, uh, different uh, all beach and rock outcroppings, a lot of cobble beach, and a lot of forest. By the way, for those that like to, that are interested, we were there late May. The warblers were coming through like crazy. There was at least six or eight species of warbler that I was able to identify just by just walking around the uh, the uh, the lodge. And they were flitting all over the darn place. So that was kind of cool. But you can see the landscape we were fishing and the shoreline we were fishing. And that's the last couple of islands. And after that, somewhere out there is Wisconsin. So we're 
right out uh, near the big water. But the nice thing about fishing in this area is because you're fishing in this sort of secondary bay, you've got these other islands. So if, when there's strong winds, you don't get this, uh, you don't quite get the swells you might get when the lake gets angry from with the big water. You can also see there's a lot of shoal. So if you don't know what you're doing, especially if it's early evening, and you don't know where you are, you know, you could, uh, you could uh, have, have a little bit of a problem in this area. But when we fished, the fish were there. Pretty exciting. And uh, so we, so I'll be talking a bit more about, this is probably the average size of uh, brook trout that we're catching with that nice, beautiful silvery sheen that you can see. So what were we doing? First of all, we were fishing close to shore in the lodge. Uh, time of year we were there, it was late May. I can't remember, I have to look at my notes, but I think it was like the 20, it was right after Labor Day. So it was like the 24th, 25th of May till the 28th or 29th. Uh, water was cold. Uh, temp water temperature was uh, six degrees centigrade or 43 Fahrenheit, sometimes colder in the morning. We were looking for the range. This is what Gary was telling us. You want to look for a range when it gets at least 45 to 50 Fahrenheit or 7.2 to 10 degrees C. That's when the fish become more active. And as a result of that, you want to be fishing close to shore because the shallow areas warm up faster than the deep water. And why do, uh, do you want to fish where it gets warmed up first? That's because it draws the bait fish in. There's lots of uh, diatoms and other materials and bugs along those rocky shorelines, especially where there's lots of rocks and boulders, not just fine cobble and coarse sand. So you get sculpin, minnows, smelt, all sorts of uh, critters in there that uh, these coasters are looking for as they swing, swim along the shoreline. And one of the things that Gary said is, you want to cast and try to put your fly almost on shore and then work it back. And that's what we did and that's how we caught fish at this time of year. And we, what we were also looking for was complex structure along the shoreline. Uh, if you have uniform cobble or sand beaches, it's not the best. The fish may swim along there, but they're not going to concentrate there. They're moving, look, they're looking more so for this type of rocky structure with boulders and then a point that concentrates the fish coming around. Maybe this will warm up a bit more, but lots of boulders and other structure along here, along these edge. Right here is about maybe about two feet, three feet of water. And it'll be three, three feet. And then all of a sudden it gets five feet and then six, seven, eight, ten feet. A lot of the fish cruise right along these edges, right about here. And then dart in, come back out, dart in, going after minnows and that sort of stuff. And then, of course, they'll concentrate as they come around the point. So these points are really hot spots to look at as well. And again, you want to look for the where the where shelves from shallow to deep uh, with that rapid pop off. And these points and undulations are really great hotspots. One thing is that, you know, as I said, uh, I was uh, talking to somebody, I said, you don't have to imagine what a great inland ocean would look like. All you have to do is experience Lake Superior. It is the largest freshwater lake in the world. Lake Bacall is a bit bigger, but it's brackish. It's not pure fresh freshwater. So Lake Superior is the largest freshwater lake in the world and the largest cold water lake in the world. So it's pretty damn special. And the shoreline, the landscape, spectacular, and beautiful, and it's constantly changing. The weather here is constantly changing. It's just phenomenal. Beautiful landscape features, big mounds of sheer rock popping into a uh, to deep water with shoals offshore coming up suddenly, big knobs coming up. And this <laughs> interesting arches and of course the lichens and, and such really liven it up as well. Really beautiful landscape to fish. And this is looking e uh, eastward um, from uh, Gary's place along the shoreline towards uh, Terrace Bay. So this is a drive, this is a driving trip that you can drive right to the, to the, you can drive from Southern Ontario to the, to the marina in Nipigon, and then Gary takes you out and then it's not as though you have to fly in here. You can drive and get boated to uh, your, your spot. So that's what makes this so darn special. But again, the complexity is quite amazing. This is the, um, the narrows coming out of, of uh, Nipigon Bay. And then there's these, these uh, series of islands with, you can see these knobs of rock here and there. This is Bowman Island here. And the lodge itself is situated right about where my arrow is, 
he is right about there. So it's very well protected from the big water here. These big strong winds coming in are broken up to a certain degree by a lot of these islands, which makes it beautiful fishing all along this coastline here. And if you look a little bit closer, you can see these points, these shoals popping up here and there all over the place. This, this area, I mean, it's if you're looking for complex habitat that will draw fish like a coaster in and where you have these deep shoals that come up from 30, 40, 50, 60 feet to two or three feet in depth, where they, these also bring in the lake trout, who are also moving into these areas in the springtime, looking for slightly warmer water and active bait. Tackle we were using, uh, we were using uh, um, um, rods provided by Orvis, so we were using the Orvis Helios rods, uh, nine foot rods, six and eight weight with matching uh, uh, reels. Uh, we were using weight forward lines. Uh, I think most of the fishing um, raw, uh, mark uh, used the intermediate line, uh, medium sinking intermediate line. I used a floating line with a high D sink tip. Our leaders were fairly simple. It was uh, six feet of straight 25 pound fluorocarbon and a two, two to three foot long uh, tippet of 12 pound fluorocarbon tip. Again, these fish, if they that dash in amongst the rocks and the boulders will, will scrape your leader. So that, uh, and they weren't leader shy. So that allowed us to be able to fight the fish well, bring them in quickly without exhausting too much. The flies we use, we use a variety of streamers, mostly streamer flies at this time of year. Uh, best producers um, were brown or olive woolly buggers, also some um, zoo cougar streamers and olive and brown. Again, they, they're imitating uh, sculpins and other types of uh, small minnows, dace and such. Sculpt, I use the sculpin pattern almost exclusively. Um, Mark um, sort of uh, mixed it up a little bit. He also used this smelt pattern here to good effect for lake trout. I used pretty well exclusively um, a streamer fly that Sylvia D'Amelio invented up in Nipigon when she was uh, doing research up there. Called the, her, she calls it the soggy bog. And uh, again, it's a sort of a sculpin type imitation. This is what it looks like right here. As a matter of fact, last year during the uh, fly tying for conservation for Trout Limited, Sylvia demonstrated how to tie the soggy bog. I took that course and I tied a dozen of them. Uh, actually more than a dozen take with me when I went up there. And this is what happened to it. As a matter of fact, I just want to let you know that fly in the top there, as that individual fly accounted for 17 fish during that uh, during our trip, um, and uh, <laughs> which was quite pretty good for uh, a single fly. Uh, the construct the this construction that uh, Sylvia recommended how we uh, how we tie them in worked really well. It's just that deer hair just couldn't handle those sharp teeth for too long. Mind you, hand handled it for 17 fish, so I guess I couldn't complain. So I'll just show you day one in pictures. So here's some of the shoreline we were fishing. Again, we were fishing these areas, so the boats would be drifting along here. The morning we were fished uh, with Gary, or Gary pointed things out to us. And then in the afternoon, for the rest of the trip, it was just Mark and myself and Ryan, our cameraman, that uh, went out on these trips. Uh, here I am just casting away. It's, I think this is my second coaster, which was really quite a nice fish. Um, very hard fighting fish. Uh, they hit like, well, sometimes they, it's the fly just seems to want to stop. Other times they, they almost yank it out of your, the rod out of your hand. They're fairly aggressive at this time of year. The water's cold, which means that as soon as it warms up a little bit, they've got a lot of energy and they know how to use it. So we fished, uh, I think we got eight or 10 fish that first day um, of fishing and it was really beautiful. And again, we caught all our fish within sight of the lodge, went back to, to the lodge for lunch back out again for a few more hours, you know, actually about four or five hours, and then came back for a nice uh, nice dinner. You know, the neat thing about uh, northern climates is if you don't like the weather, wait a minute. Uh, so weather changes fairly fast up in that, that, that area. So the second day, there was a uh, big wind started to come up. Uh, there was um, there was big swells coming in from the big lake and it was going to, the winds were supposed to get stronger over the course of the day. But Gary suggested that we just go around the point. He said there was a, we, I, I just mentioned that the first night we were there before we, before we fished, we had a heavy, heavy storm come through. A thunderstorm came through, dumped a lot of water. And the, the little streams off Ign Igneous Island and elsewhere were just really churning out water out into the lake. 
So Gary said, well, there's a little screen that comes in off of um, around the point there. You might, we might want to try this. I'll take you guys out there in my boat. I'll, I'll show you how to get around there because there's a lot of shoals and you might be able to get a, about a half hour, hour of fishing there before the swells get too bad. And then we will go back closer to the lodge where the, uh, where the conditions will be a bit tamer. So we went out there and there's a stream coming and it was really ripping uh, uh, in there. And of course you, ha you have to think, okay, so this is, there's been sort of the stream has really kicked up energy. So it's really moving fast. It's bringing in all sorts of debris from the shore, which mean, which includes bugs, other little critters, some of the fish that small fish that were up there coming down. And it, with all that food coming in, the minnows are probably coming in close to that shoreline to feed on all the debris coming in, which means the big guys are coming in to feed on the little guys. So we got there and, uh, Mark and I tried to brace our, uh, our knees against the gunnel so we could cast without falling in. And the winds were fairly strong as well. And the swells were pushing us towards shore and onto the shore. So we had to be careful with how we managed the boat. But we started casting and sure enough, fish were there. I think it took, uh, I think it took Mark three casts to hook his first, his first fish there. It was a beautiful fish. Just look at those blue spots. It's just, just absolutely lovely. So, Kept on fishing, and this was the hot spot. You can see the river coming in here, blasting it, and there's, you can't quite see it. There's a boulder right there. There's another boulder right there. And you're, and even though this is the lake, with the water coming in, it was so strong, there was, of course, um, sort of dead, dead zones, both behind it and along this margin here. And actually, there's a pillow in front of it. And the fish were sitting all along the edge here and that pillow there, and then this pillow here. And so if you cast right into there and started pulling it through, you quite often caught fish. And this is just a, a very rough illustration coming in and coming in. The shoreline is all cobbled gravel here, boulders, I should say. There it is. So the fish were all concentrating either here or we cast right except to here, let it swing through here. If nothing caught there, we just let it swing through and then started pulling off as it came past here or we cast over here, pull it through that dead zone. And there's a lot of fish through there. We didn't stay too long because of the weather, but uh, we were able to catch some really nice fish there. So we went back uh, and fished along the further shoreline a little bit later that day and still caught fish actually fishing the shoreline on Bowman Island as well. But that mor next morning when we got up, the weather was changing again. This time, fog banks were rolling in heavy fog banks were rolling in. And we knew that we, we wouldn't have, if we wanted to fish, we needed to make sure that we knew where the heck we were so we didn't get lost. Because uh, at one point the fog was so thick that I think we were going along slowly and I checked my, uh, actually I still got GPS coverage on my, on my cell phone and I was tracking our movements. And at one point we made a full circle without knowing it. So yeah. <laughs> You got to be careful out there because you could end up in the big lake and not know where the hell you were. The fog did roll in and we decided to stick closer to, uh, the, to the lodge, but again, hug the shoreline of Bowman Island and fish along there. So this is the zones we're fishing. This is the Bowman Island itself, fished along these areas and <laughs> we're fishing just off it. We didn't fish for pumpkin, but we were fishing just off the, um, off the lodge and Mark got this beautiful uh, coaster right there, that's just sort of a, what he called the money shot for uh, for Gary Lang. Of course, you want to have a nice picture of the lodge, a fish being caught right in front of the lodge that you're inviting people to stay at. So it's um, <laughs> the fish are there. You, you don't even need a boat to catch them sometimes. So again, we fished along this shoreline. Just beautiful. And this is just around the corner from the, um, the lodge heading westbound and south. And there was some beautiful areas in that area. This is uh, one of the, I think one of the larger posters that um, Mark got just fishing along that part of the shoreline. It was beautiful. We got about half a dozen fish through that area. Just, but even with the fog and the overcast, it, it was it was just beautiful. The added bonus is uh, Barry had, uh, had uh, put um, a, a floating jug as a marker for one of the shoals just uh, about uh, five, 10 minutes from the, uh, the lodge around the, around the corner. And he said, if you guys are feeling bored about casting, casting coasters, catching coasters, you might want to just anchor on that knob of rock that I've marked there and cast into the deeper water and then retrieve your flies out. You might catch a lake or two. And we did. 
Got some nice Lakers in that area. Actually, we kept, I think uh, Gary was out there as well. He kept a couple and uh, we kept one. And we had uh, beautiful uh, lake trout uh, for dinner. It was, um, and these fish, for some reason, are not oily. They're beautiful, absolutely beautiful eating fish. Also fought like crazy. So it's a nice added bonus to, um, to a few days of fishing on there. Just want to give a big shout out to um, this this young guy, uh, Ryan uh, Pizzacala. Uh, he's an uh, amazing young guy. He's uh, <laughs> he's also an avid angler, so you can, you can imagine us catching fish and him just watching us all day, every day. You know, so but he's very professional about it. But at one evening, um, and we got back after a good day of fishing, and uh, Mark said after dinner, you know what, Ryan hasn't. Um, hasn't had a chance to fish at all. Mind if I just take him out? We'll pop over to that where that uh, creek's coming in. And I'll, if you mind, if he uses your rod jack, say, hell no, you he can use the fly as well. So he and Ryan went out. They were only gone for about 40 minutes. Um, <laughs> and in 40 minutes, he caught an eight pound rainbow at, at that location and that brook trout. So he's a pretty happy guy. He said before this, the biggest rainbow he had ever caught was eight inches. And again, that was on the soggy bog as was that fly, as that fish. So how are the coasters doing? Well, I just want to say and stress, it's not over yet. The population is expanding. Fish are now common out in the, around the inner and outer islands off of Nipigon and along some of the shoreline. But they're still nowhere near the full extent of their historical range. So they're still expanding that range. So the key here is that we need to continue the work we've been doing, keep up with the regs as they stand. We have to start, start continue working. And I've been working with uh, a few guys about looking at ways of putting fish uh, fish culverts or fish ways on these perch culverts so that uh, along the rail line there, just to start to allow these other tributaries to start providing recruitment to, the, uh, to um, these uh, coasters as well. Al, if, for those that may or may not know, Al Hassel, who's a wonderful artist and great angler, lives in Terrace Bay. He has now for about four or five years. And I called Al before I went on my trip. I said, uh, Al, do you catch coasters in Terrace Bay? Because he said, yeah, we catch coasters here. He said, but you know the funny thing, Jack? I said, what's that? He said, well, I fish a lot with some bunch of young guys. They're, they're like 24, 25 years old now. He said, but they tell me that when they were kids growing up, you never saw a coaster, ever. As a matter of fact, they never saw coasters until the last five years, and now they're common. So those fish are now moving out of that core area off Nipigon Bay and are moving now along the shoreline, along Terrace Bay, and heading east. And hopefully, if we can start opening up some of those other trips again so these fish can spawn, we'll see them all the way perhaps down to Sault Ste. Marie again in good numbers. So we need... My key message to everybody is we need to stay course. So in summary, I'd like to say that Gary Lang mentioned to us that about 20 or more years ago, that in a weekend of fishing, you might be able to catch two or three brook trout in the lake. Most were rarely over 12 inches. Now in three days of fishing, within sight of his lodge, we hooked and landed 27 coasters, a couple of over 22 inches. And again, the range was from 12 to 23 with an average size of 19 inches. Pretty damn nice fish. And as I said, uh, there were three lake trout caught by Mark and a seven pound rainbow as well as a nice brookie caught by Ryan. And that was my big, best uh, brook trout, which is my, my so far my largest to date. And that was about 21, 21 inches. And uh, I was very pleased to catch that guy. He fought like like the Jesus. For anybody that's interested, I uh, think... Like, um, and Mr. Green is, uh, is, is going, but uh, you can always drop Gary and Leanne a, Lang a line about it. This, uh, that's the information about it. Uh, you can find their information at uh, bowmanislandcharters.com. There's his email address as well as a phone number. Um, the episode that, um, that I hosted, um, I, I don't think it's been scheduled yet for, uh, for broadcast, likely not until April at the earliest. I suspect there's a whole bunch of other programs coming out. But for those of you that are interested for free, uh, the new fly fisher has a YouTube channel. 
you can subscribe and then you can watch their premier shows uh, on that. And they're also on Facebook. And if you like them on Facebook, you'll see, get notifications as well as lots of um, tips in that um, on fishing uh, that they post quite often, uh, two or three tips a week. Uh, well, so it's, uh, it's well worthwhile uh, to, uh, to, to uh, check out the new fly fisher and the, and this, and the programming that they're producing right now. So that's the talk.